now that the confederacy of the five kings of Canaan is ended, Joshua sets his sights upon the remaining nations of the promised land and proceeds to vanquish all of the enemies of God. This is the 36th sermon in the series on victory, conquest, and inheritance, and exposition on the book of Joshua. Our roll covenant reading coming from Joshua, Joshua chapter 10, beginning in verse 28, beginning in verse 28, Joshua chapter 28, Joshua chapter 10, beginning verse 28, through the end of the chapter. By inspiration of God, the prophet writes, And that day... Joshua took Makeda and smote it with the edge of the sword and the king thereof. He utterly destroyed them and all the souls that were therein. He let none remain and he did to the king of Makeda as he did unto the king of Jericho. Then Joshua passed from Makeda and all Israel with him unto Libna and fought against Libna. And the Lord delivered it also in the king thereof into the hand of Israel and he smote it with the edge of the sword and all the souls that were therein he let none remain in it but did unto the king thereof as he did unto the king of Jericho. And Joshua passed from Libna and all Israel with him unto Lachish and encamped against it and fought against it. And the Lord delivered Lachish into the hand of Israel which took it on the second day and smote it with the edge of the sword and all the souls that were therein according to all that he had done to Libna. Then Horam king of Gezer came up to help Lachish and Joshua smote him and his people until they left none remaining. And from Lachish Joshua passed unto Eglon, and all Israel with him. And they encamped against it and fought against it. And they took it on that day and smote it with the edge of the sword. And all the souls that were therein he utterly destroyed that day, according to all that he had done to Lachish. And Joshua went up from Eglon, and all Israel with him unto Hebron. And they fought against it. And they took it and smote it with the edge of the sword and the king thereof and all the cities thereof and all the souls that were therein. He left none remaining according to all that he had done to Eglon, but destroyed it utterly and all the souls that were therein. And Joshua returned and all Israel with him to Debir and fought against it. And he took it and the king thereof and all the cities thereof and they smote them with the edge of the sword and utterly destroyed all the souls that were therein. He left nothing remaining as he had done to Hebron, so did to Debir and to the king thereof, as he had done also to Libna and to her king. So Joshua smote all the country of the hills and all the south and of the vale and of the springs and all their kings. He left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed as the Lord God of Israel commanded. And Joshua smote them from Kadesh Barnea, even unto Gaza, and all the country of Goshen, even unto Gibeon. And all these kings and their land did Joshua take at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. And Joshua returned and all Israel with him unto the camp to Gilgal. John again writing to us in chapter 19 of the revelation of Jesus Christ beginning in verse 11 to the end of the chapter, verse 21. And by the same spirit, the apostle John writes... And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword. And with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, And he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that he may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, 
and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken. And with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Thus far is the reading of God's most holy word. The grass withers, the flower thereof fades away, but the word of God stands forever. And by his holy word is the gospel presented unto us again this day. Now the warning was made perfectly clear. There could be no mistake about it. Canaan, with all of its power, was no match for the sovereign king of the universe and Joshua with his conquering army. It was also made perfectly clear that those that were not of ethnic Israel, but had been incorporated into their nation by covenant, would be protected from the enemies of God. That was God's oath. That was God's promise, His covenant oath, which He made in covenant by the oath that He had Joshua swear. God would bless those that blessed Israel. That was his promise. But his promise also included the fact that he would curse those that cursed Israel. The defense of Gibeon had been successful and the five confederate kings had been executed. We see this in verses 24 through verse 26 in Joshua 10. And it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. Remember, that was the dominion aspect where they would now take dominion control over these five nations. Put your foot upon the neck of these kings. And they came near and they put their feet upon the necks of them. And then verse 26, And afterward Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. So God had given Israel the most incredible victory over this five national confederate tribes. He had given them the victory over all the power of these Canaanite kings without any problem whatsoever. Joshua's fame by this point and the terror of the Lord was now upon every nation of Canaan. If there was any doubt, if there was any doubt at this point at all of what God would do and did by causing the sun, even the sun and the moon to remain still in the sky until Joshua had completed his military campaign of victory against the enemies of God, now there would be no question whatsoever. Now one would think after the destruction of these five nations, after the testimony of Israel and Joshua against Jericho and against Ai and now the five confederate kings, one would think that this testimony of God's power, along with the standing of the sun and the standing of the moon, which everyone now probably knew, for the word of that most assuredly went through the entire land of Canaan like wildfire, one would think that that testimony enough of God's power of conquest was enough to, to have Israel pause and say, we now have control of the entire nation. Now we can celebrate. But that was not so. Even though they had such a great victory and a string of victories, still they understood that their task was not yet complete. Joshua was on the move. His victory, his conquest had to be comprehensive, all-inclusive. Simply because they had won a decisive victory in the battle against the kings, in the battle against Jericho and Ai, that was no excuse to stop from going into the entire nation of Canaan for a complete and total conquest. You see, that was the plan from the beginning. Not just a victory here, a victory there, but a total conquest. That was the goal that God had given Joshua and Israel. And there's a lesson for us even in that very simple fact. Winning one or two cultural battles are never enough. Simply by being in the battle is also not sufficient to declare victory. Since the culture is vast 
and very complex and its consequences systemic, it must be fought with a long-term, even a generational strategy in mind. One victory is not enough. And we should never take off our armor declaring and celebrating a victory until all of the nations of Canaan are subjugated unto the majesty of the Christ. But in order to do that, it takes consistency of devotion, resolve, tenacity for the glory of God in full dedication to the kingdom's advance. I believe that is what's lacking in the Christian community today. Not only is there not a momentum built up, there must be a momentum maintained. And most importantly, it must be maintained generationally. And that's where the burden falls upon the parent. The burden falls upon mommy and daddy and to make sure that that idea of comprehensive cultural generational conquest for the advancement and the glory of God is maintained. Your child must be indoctrinated. Maybe that's not a good word, but that is the word. Unto the praises and the glory of God, the God of Israel, the God of Scripture so that they would continue after you're long gone with your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren to continue this battle generationally, long-term. Fits and starts can never effectively win the culture war. And it most certainly cannot advance the kingdom of God. There must be a continuous battle waged if the forces of secular humanism are to be vanquished. That goes also true to the battle you fight against your own sin. If it's not constantly mortified, constantly waged, and you lift up your guard, you take down your guard, you will find that the enemy will ascend upon you. So with this in mind, with this goal in mind, that it wasn't enough for Joshua and the children of Israel to vanquish Jericho, Ai, and the five confederate kings, with this in mind, Joshua enlarges the battle plan and he moves throughout the surrounding regions of Canaan. He had momentum. And he wasn't going to let that momentum be lost. He was going to maximize. He was going to capitalize upon that momentum. So once the initial major resistance of the five kings was broken, Joshua is now unrestrained. And so Joshua moves on to Makeda, Libna, Lachesh, Horam, Eglon, Hebron, Debir, and the remaining portion of the land of Canaan. One region after another, one city after another, one city after another of these city-states of the Canaanite tribes are falling before Israel's conquering wrath by God's power upon them. The entire southwest region of Canaan falls in one united Israelite campaign under Joshua. And the cities are now overthrown and their kings are executed. This is a slaughter of all slaughters. And that day Joshua took Makeda and smote it with the edge of the sword. And the king thereof, he utterly destroyed them. And all the souls that were therein, he let none remain. And he did to the king of Makeda as he did unto the king of Jericho. That was the pattern. Now note very carefully the way the scriptures are worded. No one remained. Everyone was destroyed. It was a comprehensive, total annihilation, including the king. So everyone was destroyed, and the kings of these city-states, these nations, these tribes, were not only executed, but they were crucified on a tree signifying God's judgment upon them, because they were cursed. They had came against Israel, they did not bless Israel, then they would be cursed of God. This act of destroying city after city after city and destroying and executing one king after another and then putting them on a tree to display that they were cursed of God became Joshua's signature. And in our modern mindset, our modern conception, this is barbaric. 
And yet this was the commandment of the righteous God of heaven and earth. So this act becomes Joshua's signature. It also becomes his warning. This was meant as a warning. Actually, it was meant as a promise to anyone and everyone that seeks to defy the army of Israel and to besmirch the name of Yahweh. Dr. Joseph Moorcraft observes, he says, Makeda was annihilated because it was placed under the divine covenant curse of Hiram. Now remember, Hiram was the concept, the doctrine of total destruction, the Karim principle. So these nation states were placed under the total destruction commandment of God. He continues, it, like Jericho, was wholly devoted, that's what Kara means, was wholly devoted to the Lord in order to be wiped out. Joshua then moves on to Libna, which, again, the Kerem curse was also to be placed upon that area and its king for total destruction, verse 29 and 30. Then Joshua passed from Makeda and all Israel with him. Now please note, every time Joshua goes, the Bible is very clear. It doesn't want to leave anything to your imagination or your confusion. It says, and all Israel with him. Just as Jesus goes before us, so do we follow. Joshua goes there as the general, all Israel with him. When Jesus Christ goes before us into the nations of the world, we are to follow. So, Joshua passes from Makeda and all Israel with him unto Libna and fought against Libna and the Lord delivered it also. And the king thereof, in other words, the head of the snake, has to be cut off. It has to be crushed into the hand of Israel. He was brought and he smote it with the edge of the sword and all the souls that were therein, he let none remain in it. Notice again, no one remained. A very comprehensive slaughter but did unto the king thereof as he did unto the king of Jericho. So as with every one of these conquered cities, it was the pleasure of the Lord. Notice, this was the commandment of God because it pleased God. So wrap your minds around this, that the destruction of these wicked nations, the total comprehensive annihilation of these nations was pleasing to God because God does not command anything that is not pleasing to him. So God is commanding the destruction of these nations. So as with every one of these conquered cities, it was the pleasure of the Lord to give them to Israel as an example for us today as we wage a spiritual war, a spiritual battle against God's enemies by the edge of the sword, but that sword is the sword of the Spirit. But it is no less a bloody battle. It's ideological, but it's ravaging. Morecraft again observes, he says, Jehovah gave Libna to Israel as Israel waged war against Libna. The issues of the southern campaign as well as the conquest of the rest of Canaan was the result of God's gracious and sovereign giving of the land to his chosen people as they worked hard to conquer it. End quote. Notice, as they worked hard to conquer it. The taking of the land took work. It took concentration, it concentrated effort, it took time, it took planning, strategizing, it took action because cultural reorientation takes action, it takes work. Note what Israel did not do in order to be victorious. And this is as important as what they did to take the land. Firstly, they didn't simply pray about defeating the enemy. Oh yeah, they began there. They began there, but that is not where it ended. Prayer is not action. Prayer is the beginning of action. It's the solidification of your mind before God and before His throne as to what action should be taken. But prayer... Make no mistake about it, is not action. Also, they didn't just talk about defeating the enemy. They didn't pray and then sit down and talk and that was the end of it. Neither did they simply write about it. 
They prayed. They discussed it, yeah, but it didn't end there. They didn't write about it. It didn't end there. And neither did they slander their own warring colleagues. You don't see any any problems within the camp of Israel under Joshua where there was any difficulty, any slander, any backbiting, any tumult within the camp. No. They were working as a unified effort. But they worked. More importantly than they worked, they worked together. Again, a unified front. They worked in full dedication as one man, full dedication to their task, with full knowledge of the Lord and full knowledge that He would deliver each and every one of them unharmed. Note, all returned, notice, all returned to the camp at Gilgal after the battle was over. Verse 21, And all the people returned to the camp to Joshua and Makeda in peace. None was lost. Once Israel was convinced of what they had to do, once they sought the counsel of God, they took decisive action. And again, most importantly, they took decisive action as a unified body under one head, Joshua. Note the phrase, Then Joshua passed from Makeda and all Israel with him. Together. Joshua leads the way as Jesus leads the way and all Israel together follow. Unified body. Stress is placed here upon the unity and the unification of the people of God. This was essential. If they were to conquer these tribes, these these major tribes... They had to do so as one man. They had to do so as a unified body. This was essential. We find this phrase, and all Israel with him, in Joshua 3.7 and Joshua 3.17, Joshua 4.14, 8.21 and 24, Joshua 10.29, 31, 32, 36, 34, 38, as we have just read. And then in 23, verse 2, and all Israel with him stressing over and over and over that they were unified. They had one hope, one Lord, one faith, one goal. It was to glorify God in everything. This point must be stressed if cultural reconstruction is to be successful under the Christ of God. Now consider the importance of a unified body of Christ working together as one man. In the Lord's Prayer of John 17, Jesus stresses this idea of oneness. He prays that the Father would so establish His people as a unified front. He is praying so that there would be the pattern of Joshua against all of the wicked of Canaan moved into the New Testament in a spiritual way, but as one man. So what is he praying for? He's praying for a unification of the body of Christ. Notice John 17, beginning in verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. And then in John 20, beginning in verse 20 through 23, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Notice the, the emphasis on the oneness, the unification, even the unification of the body of Christ as one man, even as God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and God the Father, and God the Holy Spirit are one. And the glory, verse 22 and following, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one. In other words, I have given them the power to be unified. I have given them all that they need to be as one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. 
For the only way you can be made perfect or mature is by being unified in God and in one another, in Christ, as the unified body of Israel. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. This was Christ's prayer. That God's people would be one, unified, even as Joshua's Israel was unified. Paul the Apostle, he also saw the hope of victory in the unity of the brethren. In fact, it was the unity of the saints that Jesus had come to establish. Notice what he tells the church at Ephesus in chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Notice, he made us one. The Jew and the Gentile, one, just like Israel and the Gibeonites, one, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereof. Notice the stress, the emphasis on the oneness, the goal of God in the sanctification of his people, that they would be one, even as God the Lord Jesus Christ and God the Father are one. Paul goes on to stress this idea of singularity as well as unification, both to the Ephesians and to the confused Corinthians. Notice in Ephesians 4, 1 and following. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. That's the key to walking in unity. Endeavoring, in other words, laboring, laboring, here it is, hard work, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. Not two, not three, not five. One body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. To the Corinthians, who are confused, he says this in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we in Him. In other words, and we are unified in Him. Pointing back to the Lord's Prayer in John 17 and in John 20. You see, Paul understood this in light of John 17, John 20, and from the Old Testament. As the Lord Yahweh is one, or as the Hebrew puts it, echad, unified, so too are his people in him also to be as one that is unified. Notice what Moses tells Israel in Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, is unified. Anticipating the unification of those in Christ. Zechariah concurs, Zechariah 14.9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day, shall there be one Lord and His name one. Notice the idea of unity. And so when Jesus declared in Mark 12, 29, and Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He was not only making a theological statement, emphasizing the ontological oneness of the triune God, He was making a statement concerning the life of the people of God, which was to be lived in unity before God and in God. In fact, it was a declaration with intense and critical practical repercussions. The test of the church's maturity rests upon its unity in both doctrine and life. Let me say that again. The test of a church's maturity or the church's maturity. Let's broaden this field. Let's look at the whole of Christendom. The test of Christendom's maturity rests upon its unity, both in doctrine and in life. Notice how Paul cautions the church at Corinth to be careful that they do not neglect their individuality from their unity or their unity from their individuality. In other words, both are essential to the kingdom's advancement. We call this equal ultimacy. They are equally ultimate and equally primary. The ultimacy and primary aspect of both. It's important to be an individual, 
but it's just as important to be unified with other individuals in the faith. Notice what Paul says in 12.12 of 1 Corinthians. For as the body is one, notice the thread of unity. For as the body is one and hath many members, notice the oneness and the individuality of the many, the one and the many. And all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Incredible statement of the one and the many, the unity and the distinction of people, but focusing upon, again, the oneness. Now, Jonathan Edwards, the great preacher Jonathan Edwards, he perhaps understood this in a most fascinating fashion. Edwards believed that when the church finally matured, when it finally comes to that point of maturation, that point of perfection in maturity, it would, at that time, and only at that time, it would enter what he believed was its final millennial era of history. But it would not happen until the church finally embraced its maturity. And he called this the Millennial Society. In fact, Ed would spend most of his life in preaching ministry, pursuing the Millennial Society. He saw unity as the perfect blend of the good and the beautiful, both of which he saw as a reflection of God. He saw unity of the believer as a reflection of the unity in the Godhead. Knowing that the unity in the Godhead is the mature one in the many, he wanted the church of Jesus Christ to also reflect that maturity in their oneness and individuality. So he saw unity as a perfect blend of good and beauty, both of which a reflection of God. For in the unity of the Godhead, there is not only unity, And there is not only maturity, there is the perfection of beauty. Edwards maintained that all true happiness, even God's happiness, depended upon the affectionate unity of society. First and foremost in his celestial body, the saints, but ultimately within the societal order at large. You see, within the Godhead, within the ontological Godhead, within the makeup of the Godhead, there is joy and peace and beauty. That's what he wants on earth to be expressed by his people. And this amounted to the hope of a global, Christ-centered reconstruction. Edwards' thoughts on this millennial society was very much post-millennial in nature. He stated, quote, The happiness of the deity, as all other happiness, consists in love and society. There will be a time wherein this whole earth shall be united as one holy city, one holy family. Men and all nations shall, as it were, dwell together and sweetly correspond one with another as brethren and children of the same Father. A time wherein the whole great society shall appear in glorious beauty, in genuine, amiable Christianity and excellent order. And then shall all the world be united in peace and love in one amiable society." It was obvious that Edwards believed that the Christian church should strive for unity so that it may be a model for the whole society. Looking forward to the singularity and unity of the saints and the social order of the human race, Edwards said this, quote, Then shall flourish in an eminent manner those Christian virtues of meekness, forgiveness, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, brotherly kindness, those excellent fruits of the Spirit, end quote. You see, without those fruits exemplified within the body of Christ and then within the whole of human society, there cannot be any maturity and there will be no millennial society as Edwards saw it. Gerard R. McDermott explains further. Edwards believed 
that even within the structure of the unified millennial society, human nature would still have the same sinful tendency as in all the eras before the millennium, but because of the great effusions of the spirit, the religious virtue of the human heart would exponentially be multiplied. The result would be a universal diffusion of excellence of character, end quote. Notice what Edward said. He said, men and their temper and disposition shall be at that time like the Lamb of God, the lovely Jesus. The body shall be at that time conformed to the head, end quote. Like Israel, the heavenly city of the saints would then be the mirror image of the heavenly society of heaven. You see, Edwards believed that a unified body of saints yielded both beauty and joy. Think about that. Think about when everything is going well in your relationships, when everything is going well with your wife, with your husband, with your children, with your brothers, with your sisters, with your sons and with your daughters, when there is that, that harmony when there is that heavenly society, even in the microcosm of your family, when there is that unity, there is beauty, there's joy. When there's consternation, when there's contention, when there's schism, when there's strife, there is no beauty, it's ugly, it's ugliness. Likewise, within Christianity, within Christendom itself, when there is no harmony, it is ugly. When you hear... Brothers and sisters on the internet, on Facebook, within the Church of Jesus Christ and out in the marketplace, arguing and slamming, this is ugly, this is not beauty, and this is no joy. It is a sadness, or at least it should be. But Edward said, once the church matures, once the Christian matures, once the body of saints mature, and they become this millennial society, it's a beautiful thing. It's a thing to be pleased with. And there is peace and there is joy. And in Edwards' mind, beauty and joy could only be realized by biblical unity. At this time in Israel's history, they had that unity. And it was a beautiful thing. Israel was a singular army. They had one mind. They had one hope. And they functioned seamlessly under one head. They had one goal. But more than that, they were a singular body, both religiously and politically. They were the body of Christ, as well as the temple of the living God. They were also a singular national entity. The city of God. And this is what Paul was trying to convey to the church at Corinth. Moreover, Israel trusted God. They trusted that if they maintained that unity, if they maintained that tenacity, that resolve, to do what God had commanded them to do, that God would work in their behalf. They trusted that God would work in their behalf because they were a faithful people. And it took faith more than any military strategy, it took faith to conquer the enemies of pagan Canaan. Israel trusted God in that if they coupled their faith with their work, if they obeyed, if they believed in the promises of God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, they would be victorious. Faith had to be coupled, however, with a dedication to work in order for victory to be successful. James states this very clearly in James chapter 2. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Today we wonder why the kingdom of God languishes. And I believe the answer is painfully simple. There is no unity. But the problem is that Within Christendom, aside from not having that unity, there is this idea that we don't need to sacrifice ourselves for a team effort. You know, when we want to work with others, we will stand down and be amiable. We will have a biblical consensus, as long as it's not heretical. 
of how to approach a situation. It never would be for the millennial society to think my way or the highway. It would be a posture of long-suffering and kindness and gentleness and peace. See, a lot of the professors of Christianity today, they don't want to sacrifice themselves to a team effort. They want to go it alone. Yet without a unified front and a desire to work together with the kingdom goal in mind, success will never be realized. And we keep, we keep doing the same thing. We keep making the same mistakes. And then within making the same mistakes, we're making all new ones. The same mistakes are not enough. We're, we're inventing new ones. We're saying things that are absolutely inflammable. But without a unified front, success will not be realized. So moving southward, Israel engages the city of Lachish. Notice, they didn't let up. And within their battle, they maintained a unified front. Because they were encouraged by the victory. Every time there was a new victory... They said, well, this is good. It's good. We're working as a team. This is good. We're getting victorious. We're bringing the kingdom of God to bear upon the nations. So let's stay unified. Instead of saying, well, maybe let's try something new. Wait a minute. Why? Your, your plan is working. Why change it? So they move on to Lachish. Now this conquest, amazing. You think about it. Battle. The United States has been in war, what, 50 years? The most recent, 16 years? And on two fronts? And now, with the threat of another war, maybe global? Maybe on other fronts? A yeah, constant war. Haven't won any wars, but always in constant warfare. Well, it took Israel two days to vanquish Lachish. Two days to vanquish Lachish, to destroy them, and everyone executed in the process. And Joshua passed from Libna and all Israel with him unto Lachish, and encamped against it and fought against it. And the Lord delivered Lachish into the hand of Israel, which took it on the second day, and smote it with the edge of the sword, and all the souls that were therein, according to all that he had done to Libna. Two days, they were done. That's when you know God's working on your behalf. That's when you know you're doing the right thing. Not when you languish for 15, 16, 17, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of warfare. That's when you know you have been blessed of God and that's when you can declare yourself a Christian nation. And think about it. Even with the help of Horem, who came to the aid of Lachish, they still fell in two days. They still fell into the hand of God for their total destruction. Verse 33 of Joshua 10. Then Horam king of Giza came up to help Lachish. Didn't help. Maybe that's why it took two days. But he still vanquished. Joshua still vanquished them in two days. And Joshua smote him and his people until he had left him none remaining. But that didn't stop Joshua from continuing. He then focuses upon Eglon. Now this conquest only took one day. You think about this. With primitive infantry tools, they take the city in one day. And from Lake as Joshua passed unto Eglon and all Israel with him, and they camped against it and fought against it, and they took it on that day and smote it with the edge of the sword and all the souls that were therein. He utterly destroyed that day according to all that he had done to Lachish. Now consider... Consider the power and the stamina of the Israeli army to go from one city to the next, decimating each and every one of them entirely. There are no breaks here in the campaign. And you think about Christians who serve God and, oh, I'm tired, I need a rest, I can't do this, I need some break, I need a sabbatical. Wait a minute, hold it. What about Israel? They had power, they had stamina, they had stick to -itiveness. This was due to the power of God upon them as a result of their obedience. You see, God was blessing Israel. Yes, because they were obedient. Yes, because they were faithful. Yes, because they were unified. Yes, because they were tenacious and resolved to do the 
word of God and bring it to its full fruition. But God was blessing Israel for his own glory by securing his covenant promise of the land of milk and honey. They were going to inherit that land as a result of God's promise and his work in them under the leadership of Joshua. A.W. Pink makes the connection between Israel's conquest over Canaan and the Christian warfare over the enemies of Christ in the world. Notice what Pink says. Let us remind the reader once more that Israel's conquest and occupation of the land of Canaan presents to us a typical picture of the Christian's warfare and present employment in his spiritual inheritance. That warfare is many-sided and constitutes one of the principal parts of the service in which the Lord requires His people to be engaged and which renders all their other actions unacceptable unto Him while it be disregarded. Alas, that we are living in a day of such gross darkness and crass ignorance that comparatively few, even in Christendom, have any scriptural concept of the kind of enemies which the saint is called upon to conquer or the nature of the work in which he ought to abound. The worst of his foes is neither the world nor the devil, but rather his flesh. It is not external temptations, but inward lusts that constitute his gravest menace and greatest danger. It is the subduing of those fleshly lusts which war against the soul. End quote. So after Eglon, Hebron is destroyed, targeted and destroyed. And Joshua went up from Eglon and all Israel with him unto Hebron. And they fought against it and they took it and smote it with the edge of the sword. And the king thereof and all the cities thereof and all the souls that were therein, he left none remaining according to all that he had done to Eglon, but destroyed it utterly and all the souls that were therein. Again, Reverend Moorcraft explains, Hebron, about 19 miles south, southwest of Jerusalem, was placed under the Kerem curse principle, and it and all of its cities were totally destroyed. Hebron was a part of the original confederation of the five city-states. Joshua killed its king when he killed the other four. Here, Israel kills another king of Hebron when the city is destroyed. And Reverend Worcester further observes why that is. He says, from this it is obvious that Joshua's campaign thus far had occupied a certain period of time, long enough at any rate, for the people of Hebron to choose a new king for themselves. But that king here, as we've seen, is destroyed. The last city named is Debir, which was also taken by Joshua and the army of Israel, leaving only those remaining cities which are left unnamed. But there were others. Now consider the message which God is giving to Canaan and to us. Southern Canaan had fallen to Israel. Its major cities destroyed. Its kings annihilated. The Amorite confederation destroyed, thwarted, frustrated, and removed from the face of the earth. Now God claimed the land for himself. Here was the total destruction of the remaining nations. He is claiming at this point the land for himself and for all of his people according to his promise. And yet, as Moorcraft puts it, quote, the conquest of this region was not total or final. Israel conquered the land as a whole, but they did not conquer the whole land. There still was land to be conquered. They conquered the whole region, but there were still remnants to be conquered. Now, the reason for this, I believe, is that only through the antitype, the Lord Jesus Christ, can the whole land be conquered. There had to be remnants with Joshua and Israel. But under Christ's reign, when the fullness of time comes, then not only will the land as a whole be conquered, but the whole land will be conquered. So Joshua's conquest only serves as a type, an anticipation of what was to come when the Lord Jesus Christ would enter into history and subdue all nations unto him and eventually the entire earth. Now the psalmist speaks of this. The psalmist, after the days of Joshua, looks forward to the days of Christ and in the Psalms, he looks beyond that period to a day when the entire earth will come under the sovereign righteous reign of the Lord Jesus. Psalm 72, 11, 72, 17, 82, 8, 86, 9. 
Yea, all kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. His name shall endure forever, his name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him, all nations shall call him blessed. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. Isaiah confirms the Psalter's prophecy in Isaiah 2.2. 2. He says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. This is what Edwards had hoped for. This is what he saw as the millennial society. So under Joshua and under obedient Israel, God effectively subdues all Canaan. The subjugation of Canaan meant that Israel had to destroy all who breathed. That was God's direct commandment. Notice verse 40. So Joshua smote all the country of the hills and of the south and of the vale and of the springs and all their kings. He left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed as the Lord God of Israel commanded. Everyone was slaughtered. This was a bloody, bloody campaign beyond what our imagine could ever contemplate. But Calvin makes a very interesting observation. Calvin notes this. Listen well. Calvin says, these events at which all would otherwise be justly horrified, it becomes them to embrace with reverence as proceeding from God. When anyone hears it said that Joshua slew all who came in his way without distinction, the calmest minds are aroused by a bare and simple statement. But when it is added that so God commanded, there is no more ground for strong condemnation against Him, God, Then there is against those who pronounce sentence on criminals. Though in our judgment at least, the children and many of the women also were without blame, let us remember that the judgment seat of heaven is not subject to our laws. Nay, rather, when we see how the green plants are thus burned, let us, who are but dry wood, fear a heavier judgment for ourselves. And certainly any man who will thoroughly examine himself, will find that he is deserving of a hundred deaths. Why then should not the Lord perceive just ground for one death in any infant, which has only passed from its mother's womb? In vain shall we murmur or make noisy complaint that he has doomed the whole offspring of an accursed race to the same destruction. The potter will nevertheless have absolute power over his own vessel, or rather over his own clay. End quote. God was completely and utterly righteously justified. Joshua completes his campaign in verse 42. Beginning in 41 we read, And Joshua smote them from Kadesh Barnea, even unto Gaza, and all the country of Goshen, even unto Gibeon, and all these kings... And their land did Joshua take at one time because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. Now there's two particulars that need to be observed in these verses. Number one, Joshua took all these cities in one single campaign. It took a few days, but it was one campaign, no rest in between. And all these kings and their land did Joshua take at one time. One campaign. Secondly, the only way Joshua could have been so successful in one single seamless campaign, single effort, was because God fought for him. And this is why we read, because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. Without that, Joshua would not have been successful. Adam Clark observes, Joshua defeated all those kings and took all their cities in one campaign. This appears to be the rational construction of the Hebrew. But these conquests were so rapid and stupendous that they cannot be attributed either to the generalship of Joshua or the valor of the Israelites. And hence, the author himself, disclaiming the merit of them, modestly and piously adds, because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. 
It was by this aid that Joshua took all these kings and their land at one time in a single campaign. And when all the circumstances related in this chapter are properly weighed, we shall find that God alone could have performed these works and that reason and piety require that to Him alone they should be attributed." End quote. Finally, Joshua returns to the camp at Gilgal with the entire army of Israel. What's wonderful here is not a single man was killed in the battle, as it was in Ai's case. The Lord was with them in the entire campaign, and He brought them safely back to the camp as victorious Israelite warriors. Verse 43, And Joshua returned, and all Israel with him. Notice, no one died. Amazing that after such a campaign, not one died. And they returned unto the camp at Gilgal. And so Israel fights as a single unified body in faith and diligence, only to return after the battle is complete and whole as one body, victorious and blessed. May God pour himself upon the faithful church today as he poured himself upon the faithful church then so that we too, as Israel was then, we too might be one, even as he is one, for a total and complete victory over sin, death, and the world. And this we shall do, God helping us unto the praise of the glory of his grace. Amen.